want to be a family here, they often get excited about that. And that sounds to me like they've never been a part of a family before. Because the reality is family, family fights. Family struggles, family has dysfunction, that is part of being a family. And I'm very thankful for my family did struggle, we also had the ability to repent and to forgive. So today, I just want to start by repenting. And if you don't bow your heads with me, Lord, please forgive me. You said, be perfect like I am perfect. And Lord, I am so far from perfect. Every day I fail, every day I, I, I say things in ways that I don't want to say things. I, 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 I don't do things that I know I should be doing. Every day I make mistakes. I fall so short from the, the, the bar that you have for me. And you've given me everything. You've given me the Holy Spirit. You've given me forgiveness. You've given me love. You've given me all of the tools, yet still, still so many times I find myself not coming up to the bar. I can project that failure onto other people and project that into a point where I get angry and resentful with the fact that it's like, it's really, I'm frustrated at myself. And so, Lord, today, I just ask for you to allow me and us as a community to come before you totally just in awe of the fact that you still love us, that you love us despite ourselves, and that your mercies are new every morning. So Lord, I am dependent on your grace. I am dependent on your mercy. Forgive me and allow me to come and meet you here in this place in worship. Show me your wisdom, your grace, your love, your truth. And help me to forge a new way. Help us all to forge a new way today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we come before the Lord in worship, not because he, we are so great, but because He is so great. Whatever go, is going on in your life today, God is in the midst. God is speaking. God is moving. Let's give Him room and see what God does today. Let's worship Him and see how God can transform the circumstances, even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. He's always working. Ah. Good morning, Freedom Church. <laughs> Let's stand up Good and morning. worship our God together. Let's go. Give him praise.
Let's let me hear it.
Purchase the 
to give praise to your name. We don't sing to man. We sing to you, Father. Bless us, keep us, guide us on this path of life that can be so strenuous. Help us to see your perfect will in our lives all times. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. We give you the glory forever and ever. And if you can't say that today, don't leave here. Don't leave here without asking the Lord Jesus Christ to come in and be your personal Savior and King. We ask it, we praise you in Jesus' name. Good morning, Freedom Church. Good morning. 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 Good
Lord Jesus, we just pray over the offering today for just the so many people that it's going to help in our community. Every time we give, you give to us, we give back to you, Lord. We pray over Richard, who's going to give the message today, and just may the Holy Spirit just envelop him, and just that, that you just speak through him, Lord, with a softened heart and mind for you, Christ. And it's in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Morning. There's a song that uh, talks about how they want to come back to the heart of worship, this worship band, and it says, um, you know, I want to bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within to the way things have been, you're looking into my heart. And it goes, Lord, let me go back to the heart of worship. You know, today, I I prepared a message that I feel unable to give. Because I want to give more than a message. A sermon in itself is not enough. Like God searched so much deeper within. There's nothing wrong with, you know, coming and and bringing all that you are to give the best that you've got. Whether it's worship or a sermon, like you're just... You're pouring into, you know, I love public speaking and study it from all of the mechanics of it. But in the end, powerful words don't change lives. Love does. But the sermon series is hurt people heal people. Like how hurt people heal people. And that is not easy. Because naturally hurt people hurt people. Sometimes with the best of intentions, with nothing but love in our hearts, we go out and we end up hurting people. And it's hard. And so, like, I don't know what to do today, but then to come before you guys and say, this is, this is tough. And this is something that we cannot do. We will absolutely fail at this if we're not 100% in the Lord. It's tough enough to look at trying to figure out what to do with yourself. But then when you look at other people, and you're supposed to, like, talk to other people, you're supposed to love other people, you don't even know how to love yourself. How are you supposed to love other people? And there's no great solutions. There's no easy answers. The first thing that I think we just have to all realize is this is really tough. But with God, all things are possible. So here I am, a broken man who makes mistakes all the time and says things in the wrong way. In fairness, I do come about it naturally. No, I mean, like, I, I, I said before in sermons that I can't blame my dad for anything because he was such a great, loving dad, but there's one thing that I can blame him for. I inherited the ability to put my foot so deep in my mouth, you know, you, you wouldn't believe it was humanly possible. 
my dad has a way of phrasing everything as poorly as you can imagine. Like, if you can take having a good thing to say, but thinking about the absolute worst way to say it, that is the way my dad says most of the things that he says. And, and what's worse is, and again, I inherited this trait too, is that when he's trying to be very careful about what he says, it seems to actually enhance the effect. You know what I'm talking about? Like when you're like, okay, I gotta say this really good. Okay, let me, let me think through of like how to say it. And then you just totally go, blah, 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 blah. And the person's like, what? And you're like, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like vomiting everywhere. And it's like, and you know you're failing at it. But you just, you don't know what to do. I don't know if, uh, that, that might be a, just a Dempsey trait. Okay. <laughs> but like, I totally get there all the time. Thankfully, we have scripture. And scripture a lot of times gives us, I mean, we still fail anyway, but we have not only prescription, but description. So sometimes scripture is telling us what to do, and sometimes it's showing us how to do it. And today, what I wanted to talk about is one of my favorite books in the Bible that is almost rarely ever talked about. It's a short book, so we're going to go through almost all of it today. But it's a book that shows how to love. And Paul does it so beautifully and so wonderfully that I look back and I just marvel. It's like, wow, the Holy Spirit knew how to work through that guy. He knew how to phrase things. He knew how to put things in a way that compelled people to love. So with that, the big question that we have today is can the way we befriend people give others an opportunity to change? And talking about not phrasing things great, I don't actually like the way I phrase that question at all. Because I think it's confusing. It's like, can the mechanics of our relationship actually produce change in others? Is the heart of that question. I don't know if that's less confusing or more. But let's just go right to the scripture and let's read it together. We're going to read a, few, a fair amount of scripture, so prepare yourself. I'm sorry for how long this is, but we, I did cut out the ending, in fairness. So we're not reading the whole book, but we're reading most of the book. Okay, so let's read together. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. 
Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Whew. I mean, I feel like that's the sermon already. I mean, I feel like maybe we could just, I mean, we're not going to, so don't worry, because I know we don't love reading together again and again. And I, I, I know if I was sitting in the congregation, I'd be like, oh, another slide? Okay, let me get through this. But I hope we all listen to that. Because, like, that's it. That's everything that I want to say today. Like, he did such a good job compelling Philemon to love. And let's, let's think about this, okay? So to provide some context to the letter, Philemon was a slave owner. Now, it might not have been race slavery that we're talking about, but it was slavery. Onesimus was owned by Philemon. It was his property, which is something that we don't agree with that concept at all. But in that day, it was normal. And one of the things that's interesting is there's been debates about what the Bible says about slavery. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We have an entire book of the Bible. Sure, it's the shortest book. But we have the entire book of the Bible dedicated to the principle of brotherhood and not slavery. And that he sees him as a brother in the Lord, that we are equal. And one of the things that compelled people to become Christian is that unlike the caste system that was throughout every other culture, throughout every other country, like that's the norm. The norm is looking at pe some people better than others based on what they make or what they do or how much money they have or, or like what their ethnicity is of like, I'm better than you. And then like Christianity was like, no, 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 not anymore. And from the early church, there was rich people and slaves that were calling each other brothers and sisters. There's no way that we can understand how revolutionary that was in that time period. But considering that we've been struggling with some of those issues since the 19, like as recently as the 19, well, we're still struggling with those issues. What am I talking about? That it shouldn't be too surprising how shocking this was in that culture. I mean, like, in the 1960s, we wouldn't be able to have the blended worship that we have of people of different ethnicities standing before and, and worshiping God together. And like, praise the Lord for that. That is, that is one way our culture has grown and matured. Paul got it. Paul got it right from that core. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's it. But one of the things that I want to say in this, this call to loving people, the way that, that Paul loved Onesimus, is just like we've got to prepare for the journey. This is not easy. There's a saying about a Band-Aid. What's the saying about a Band-Aid? Anybody, what's the saying about a Band-Aid? How do you do it? Rip it off quick, right? That's the saying. So they did research on this. And you know who ripping band-aids off quick is easiest on? The ripper. It is not easy on the patient. It is the worst way to take off a band-aid. Why do they say, oh, just rip off the band-aid? Because it's really easy for the nurses. 
So that's why it's a drip off the band-aid, because it's like, ah, man, I just want to get this over with. All right. <laughs> ah, right. The person isn't doing any better. The reality is that the easiest way to do it for the person is, is in love is slowly over time just like nurturing, creating an environment and, and slowly just peeling that thing away. I had a friend who was a nurse and one of the things that he would do, he had patients that were going through a treatment process and every other, pa- every other nurse would say, this is going to be slightly uncomfortable. You guys are, know what, like when, like for instance, they they say, hey, you might feel a slight prick. And then they bring out the biggest needle you've ever seen in your life. And they start stabbing it in you over and over. And you're questioning what they meant by a prick. Because you're thinking about them more than the needle. Because it's like p- so painful. And you're like, this nurse, he did something different. He said, this is going to be hell. You are going to hurt, and you're going to hurt a lot. And there's going to be a point in this process that you think you're going to die. And if you give up, then you will. But if you keep going, when you are, you feel like death, and you feel like this is the end, and there's no way you can do it, then you're going to get through it, and it's going to be okay. And he would tell all of his clients that, and he said it was super uncomfortable for him to do it for him. Because nobody wants to be the bearer of that news. But guess what happened? His clients finished the process, went through it at a far greater rate than any other nurse. Till they asked him what he was doing, he told them, and then they end up having the whole hospital have to follow this new guidelines to actually, instead of making it, oh, it's going to be a slight, incom- it's going to be slightly uncomfortable to all of them say, you're going to feel like giving up and you're going to feel like dying. And so one of the things that I love is this quote from uh, Bonhoeffer. I've got it here on the screen with the, the one with the, um, when Christ calls man, there you got it. When Christ calls a man, he bid him come and die. There's a saying that says, you win people to what you win them with. I don't want to win you to Jesus is fun. I want to win you to Jesus can transform your life, but you're going to go through the process of dying to get there. Jesus can make life where there seems to be death, but you've got to get death first. You've got to die. When I was going through the process of the 90 days with my, my good friend and roommate, there were so many times that he wanted to quit, and he felt, and he was so hurting and in pain and was going through this this hellacious experience and I I would always say to him what did you expect death to feel like did you expect it to be pleasant and easy no you're dying so that you can be born again we're dying to the flesh so that we can be born again I said this is a hard process and so here's the reality is we cannot create change in others I want us to understand that we cannot create change in others. We cannot change others. It says, but when we change ourselves, we may end up changing the world. That's their quote. Well, the next slide, we cannot create change in ourselves, though. Let's be honest. I have the quote from Liar, Liar. It's this little silly quote, but have you you guys seen the movie? Anybody seen the movie, Liar, Liar? There's this great scene, he can't lie, and he's a lawyer, which basically ruined his career. Because that's what he got, he gets paid to be a liar. I mean, lawyer. You know, it's like, right? He's, no offense to all the lawyers, a little offense to all the lawyers in the congregation. Point is, there's a point where he's like starting with something simple, and he's like, the pen is red. The pen is red. And you can see it doesn't go well as he's got blue written all over his face because he can't get it. And he keeps going, it's all a matter of willpower. And sometimes we can think that the transformation is all a matter of willpower. Try it. It will not last. You cannot change yourself. I, I used to say this to a congregation. I said, I've got good news for you. People do change. Bad news is, Usually for the worst. 
right? We're constantly always changing. And automatically for the worse. I know this is like the most depressing sermon you've ever heard in your life. But here's the thing. Without God, without intentionality, without coming before him to the altar again and again, yeah, change automatically does happen for the worse. But, but we can give God room to create change, both in ourselves and others. Unless the Lord builds a house, the labors they built in vain. It's not going to last. Last week, we talked about loving your neighbor, and it was Valentine's Day or close to it, so we gave out flowers to the women of the church to just show them that God loves them in a practical way. This is one of those flowers. Okay? This is one of those flowers that was not loved. It was in my car. <laughs> this, is, this is what I do, <laughs> okay, to flowers. It had no water. Look at this thing. This is horrible. This is pathetic. And you could be like, yeah, but well, it's carnations. They don't last long. This is what Leah did with the flower. Look at this thing. I stole Leah's flower. Sorry, Leah. I didn't ask her permission. All right. Look at it. It's beautiful. It's blossomed. It's like vibrant. It's color. Look at the difference. This is when a man takes care of something. This is when a woman takes care of it. Like, what is the deal? You know? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm besmirching all men. This is when your pastor tries to take care of something. This is when someone who is generous and loving and wonderful as Leah is able to take care of it. It's beautiful, it's amazing. What can we do? We can create room. We can create a space. We can create an environment of love that gives people an opportunity for transformation. These words are going to sound familiar. Paul loved Onesimus. Paul saw himself as no better than Onesimus. And Paul never gave up on him. Those three phrases should sound familiar because that was Pastor Roger to a T. I love you. I'm no better than you. I'm never giving up on you. That was what Paul did for a slave. That in that culture would be seen as so much beneath a Pharisee of Pharisees and a Roman citizen. Okay? We're talking about the most elite of elite. We don't know the, the resources Paul had, but they were probably substantial. Paul was in the highest tier, both in Jewish culture and in the secular culture of the day. As a Roman citizen, he had rights that many of the other people did not have. As a Pharisee, he was looked up to, and he was seen as a high uh, a Pharisee because he was the one that they, they looked to to see if they could kill a Christian or not. They looked to, to, to Paul, Saul at the time. So he was this elite man, and here he goes, and he says, this slave and I were both prisoners, what? For the gospel of Christ. So there's a few different methods to try to create change. The first one, this is my favorite, it's reason. Okay? We have this idea that we can go, there's a, someone with a scrambled brain, it's all chaotic, and we are going to speak order into their life. How well does that work? Not very. I wish this would work. I spent so much time learning what's called apologetics, which basically means convincing people rationally that there is a God. Oh, Man, did I get good at it. I won every argument. It, it ended with, you're stupid and you're going to go to hell. I won every single one of those arguments. I mean, you know, I was right, right? No, I was so wrong. Because even in the, my premise of that I could rationalize someone into transforming their life was a flaw, flaw, uh, flawed premise. 
they did, there's this book called The Power of Habit. It's a secular book written by a secular art, uh, um, author. And in it, it talks about the transformation that sticks when it comes to substance abuse. And what they would find is that most people that changed their lives for the better did so until a storm came. And then the moment a storm came, they went back to the status quo, back to self-defense mechanisms, back to the way that they operated before, back to what? Drugs, drinking. That's, that's what they do, except for one group. Do you know what that group was? Anybody have a guess? The Celebrate Recovery Group. <laughs> kind of. Kind of. When they did interviews, there was one trait that the people that stuck in recovery had that the people that didn't, didn't have. They had a real deep belief in God. The ones that were like, I know that there's a God, and I know he is with me. So they could what? Lean on something in the storm that's far greater than themselves. Rationality will fail in the storm. So then there's the other, which is force. Now, let me be clear about this. Force is a very effective mechanism for tr change. I don't want you to misunderstand that. It absolutely, and I, I'm not just talking about violence. I'm talking about argument, too. I'm talking about manipulation. I'm talking about all the ways that we can pressure people into doing what we want. Very effective. And it will create change. The problem is what kind of change that it'll create. Because usually, or always eventually, it creates negative change. It creates division, it creates conflict, it creates war. And there's a great quote that is uh, attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte, who is, if for those of you who are not history buffs, very successful conqueror. And he said, Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded emperors, empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. That was a long time after Jesus had died, by the way, that still millions would die, the drop of the hat for Jesus. Why? Because he built his on love, and that's the last one. The third me method to influence others is, is love or inspiration. And there's a little example of like the boss telling people, go, and the leader who's like leading in the front. Jesus laid down his life for others, showing us how we can actually inspire people to love. But here's the thing. It doesn't work consistently. It doesn't work predictably because it doesn't have control. So the way, way we do it is we love, we inspire, we do what we can, and we have no idea what's going to happen. We have to give up the control to make it work. And so that's the downfall. I want you to see that there's some, like, there's some negatives here. There's a reason why we go to the other two. Because, like, I remember when I was doing this, like, 90-day dedication, I had all of these ideas of the people that this would be perfect for. And, like, none of them did it. All of the people that I hoped would be inspired to change didn't. But these individuals that I never expected to jump on board did and had permanent change in their life, permanent transformation. So when we do this, when we decide, you know what, I'm just going to live my life loving God and inspiring, like, you never know where it's going to go. One of the things with the seed thrower that's given in this parable with Jesus is, like, he's the worst gardener in the world. Have you ever thought about that? Like, why is this guy sad or so bad at knowing how to garden? Gardeners not throw seeds on the middle of a paved road. It has zero chance of growing there. But when we are sowing the seeds of the gospel, we throw seeds everywhere. Because you know what? It's not our place to judge. You never know when transformation is going to take place. And you never know who transformation is going to take place in. Sometimes it's the least likely people 
I can tell you there are some people that I've, I've like ministered to, and I'm thinking in my head because I can get there, where I'm like, this is just a drink offering. This person isn't going to do anything. And then years later, they were the one carrying on ministry and, and doing these amazing things for God because God did a transformation that I didn't even see as possible. So we just have to be faithful to love. Paul, in this book, was a friend to both Philemon and Onesimus, even though they were at odds. Now, Onesimus wronged Philemon, according to that culture, by running away, maybe even stealing stuff. We don't know all the context to the story, but here Paul manages to love Philemon and Onesimus at the same time. It's a beautiful way that he mediates. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born in a time of adversity. A brother is born at a time of adversity. Man, may we be the kind of people as a community that when there's conflict, we dig in and we unite together. But for that, we got to be a forgiver. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. One of the things Paul does in this point, in this one message where he goes like, anything, we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but anything he owes you, charge it to me. But remember what you owe to me. Remember what God already did through me in you, is what Paul said. Because Paul, he shared the gospel with Philemon. He's like, remember what God has done for you. That's such a key to forgiveness for me is that remember how much God has forgiven us. It's so great. It's so powerful. Be a future inspirer. And for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. He knew that he could have told him, like, just do this. He had the authority, but instead he appealed in love. And it we don't know the end of the story, but there's a bishop, Onesimus, and there's a lot of people who attribute this former slave to be someone who became a leader in the gospel to transform so many others. That's, that's powerful. That Philemon might have freed him, worked together as a brother, and Onesimus ended up being the bishop. More than a neighbor, we can create family. There's this, uh, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Like he's giving him back to him as a bro- bro- brother in the Lord. This is tough. You know, one of the things is my family, I love that they would always have this kind of open membership policy. We have so many people that call themselves a Dempsey brother or sister that were never biologically related. They weren't romantically related. They had no link to my family, but they became like a brother and sister. And and, and it, it was so great a lot of the time. It didn't mean that there weren't times that my family got hurt. And one of the things that I want to share with you guys is that there's no way to love in this kind of way that doesn't come at a cost. There's no way to do it risk-free. If you're going to invite people into your living room, you're going to get burned. If you're going to love people that are broken and create family and bonds with people, you're going to get hurt. There's no way around it. Some of it, they're just going to go off and do their own thing after they took advantage of you, and you're just going to end up feeling wounded. We're going to talk a little bit next week about trust. But here's the thing. It's not trust in people. This is a spoiler. It's trust in the Lord. It's that any cost that I have, and I'm not saying don't be wise, don't be discerning, like be careful as you do it as you can be, but there's going to be a risk that's unavoidable. And when you take that risk and get burned, you trust God that he's going to be enough for you. Paul stood in the gap. My, my roommate Joe knew the title of the sermon was Standing in the Gap, and he said he wanted to wear Gap jeans so he could be like, hey, I'm standing in the gap. <laughs> okay, it's a bad joke, but I'm even worse because I liked it so much I wanted to share it on Sunday. 
But here he says, Welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. Think about that. Now, now think about this, okay? Onesimus was a runaway slave. He sent him back with this letter. That had to be a pretty scary thing for Onesimus. He's standing before his former slave owner and just like hoping. I bet he was probably like, um, Paul, I saw your letter. Is it possible you could just order him to do it? Because you're saying you're appealing him to love instead of ordering him to do it, but that leaves a chance that he's going to just enslave me again, and I really would prefer not to have that happen. You know, so maybe you should just tell him to do it. Paul's like, trust me. Why? Because he says, if anything is owed, charge it to me. Where did Paul get that example from? Jesus Christ looked at all of the wrong that you have ever done. And he said, if anything is owed, let me pay the cost. If there's any wrong or, or, or fault in this person, let me stand in the gap. I will pay it. Charge it to me. And I think it's such a beautiful illustration for how we can stand in the gap for others. How Paul stood in the gap for Onesimus. Charge it to me. Man, we fall, we fail. And when we can have a brother in the Lord or sister in the Lord say, I'm here. You're not alone. I'll stand in the gap with you. It is amazing what a difference that can make. But for that to happen, sometimes we have to have short memories. It's the power of forgiveness. Perhaps he therefore departed for a season that he should be received him forever, it says. If Philemon continued to have the idea of Onesimus as a slave, he would never be a brother, and he would never have him forever. Sometimes we can hold back people in recovery because we still have the image of who they were as the, at their worst, and we can't let go of that. For us to be able to see transformation in the lives of our family and friends, we've got to be willing to let go of the person they're trying to die to. I had a friend who was going back to his family, and as he was going back to his family, he knew that there were going to probably be some resentment about the things that he had done because he had wronged them in the, in the midst of his addiction. And what I said to, to tell them is I said, Oh, you're talking about the old me. Yeah, I didn't like him either. In fact, I didn't like him so much I killed him. So you're welcome. Hi, I'm the new me. Because the reality is the resentments they had was about someone that he died to. And we have to be willing to, as a community, have short memories sometimes. And, and sometimes we're going to fail again and again and again. We're going to have mistakes again and again and again. God's graces are new every morning. Our grace may be new every, you know, week or so. We're not good at that. But if we're going to be a community that stands in the gap for people and gives people room for transformation, we have to be able to let go and let God. We have to be willing to give God room for the transformation he's doing in those individuals. It's not our work, it's his. The challenge Jesus gives us is this new commandment. He says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. And I know there are some people that were probably hearing that from Jesus that go, wait a second, that's not a new commandment. And they're probably thinking, I've got this. Yeah, love your neighbors yourself. We talked about this last week. But then he says the haunting words. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. And that's when all the disciples went, uh-oh. Because they had experienced what it was like to be loved by Jesus. And they were like, how do I even start to try to love people as Jesus loved me? Think about that. What's new about that commandment? The level of love Jesus is calling us to do for each other. 
This is why I'm saying, and I started this message being like, I can't do it. I cannot do it. God might be able to do it sometimes through me when I let him, but I cannot do it. To love as Jesus loved me. So that's the challenge. But what I want to say to this is that the power of one individual standing in the gap is huge, but it doesn't need to be an expert. And for those of you who were last week, I have this s- s- wheel. Uh, there's so much goodness in this wheel, but this wheel is about the different steps that we take. And it goes from dead, infant, child, young adult to parent. Never on there is expert. Never on there is someone with all of the answers who's figured it all out. I was at this meeting for people that are in the foster care uh, system. And what they were talking about is the statistics of the, the, the percentage of people who were able to be successful when they had no one that they could count on versus just one person that they knew was going to have their back no matter what. It didn't matter who it was, but that one person increased the chance of them being successful and active in the community from, I don't remember the exact statistics, but it was like a multiple of of 10. And what I thought was interesting about that statistic is it didn't frame it as if they were good enough if they were wise enough, if they had things together. It just was someone who's like, I've got you no matter what, I'm here for you. You don't have to be healed completely. You don't have to be an expert on all of the law and and all of the Bible. You don't have to have all all of the resources for someone who's struggling. But if you decide that you're going to stand in the gap for someone else, to be called to to make an impact on someone else's life and you're going to be there for them, whether they fall, whether they fail, whether they're good, whether they're bad, you've got them. You have just increased their chances of being successful by a huge margin and it doesn't matter that you were smart enough, good enough, and doggone it, people like you. Doesn't matter. It's just whether you're there. One of the things that I love about this is there's a, Paul does a wordplay thing. Onesimus means useful one. And what he says at a certain point, he says he was formerly was useless, but now he is useful. I was giving, he, would, he, 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 he ran from you as a slave, but he has come to you now as a useful brother in the Lord. He formerly was like this, and now he's coming to you blossomed and new. Receive him as such. Water him as such. Treat him as such. And watch what God can do in his life. God wants to give people a new name. He wants to give people a new healing. And he wants to use us as being part of that process. So I want to give you guys a challenge today. We had talked first about listening to the Lord. And I got to tell you, that's the most important one. I hope every one of you is taking time every day, even if it's five minutes, to just listen to what the Lord is calling you to do today. Because if you're going to stand in the gap for someone with all of the risks of being hurt and burned, you've got to be listening to the Lord of when and who and how. Because it's not a process we can do on our own wisdom, our own strength. You can't reason someone in to do it. You can't, you can't force someone in to do it. But you can in, it provide an environment for them to do it. And so I want you all to be praying about who God might be calling you to stand in the gap for. Who might God be calling you to make an impact on? I want all of you to be parents, whether you have biological children or not. Parents spiritually that you are maturing up in the faith. You grow from it too. You get set freed from it too. To look to the impact that you can make on others. But here's the thing. It's about being sent. And there's this phrase that I love. Our call is to find practical ways 
that we can demonstrate and proclaim the universal reign of our Lord. And when, if you're like, I don't know, after this last sermon last week, we challenged you to bless people, to find practical ways to love on some people, and I got a lot of great questions. What do I do in this circumstance? What do I do in that circumstance? How do I do it if I'm older? What do I do if I'm struggling with this issue? And it's like, these are great questions to wrestle through as a community in the Lord. One of the things that I'm asking you to do is to start by just journaling about it. Asking God and having this process of thinking, Lord, how can I be more intentional about being sent? Who have you called me to reach? Who have you put in my path to not only be a neighbor to, but actually a family to? How can I create an opportunity for transformation in the lives of others? And to think through that, to wrestle through that, and if all you did next week is you journaled a lot about it, but you didn't really figure any of it out, hey, keep going, figure, keep trying, keep journaling, because eventually I do believe God will call you to exactly where he has for you. You are ambassadors for Christ. God has given you the Holy Spirit, and in, with you is the power of life and death. You can stand in the gap for people. And it's not that God needs you. He's not up in heaven going, oh man, I really wish I had some help on this one. This is just too much for me. No, God's got it. But you have an opportunity to grow and be made new if you're willing to be sent by him. Let's pray. Lord, first and foremost, I just, I just confess before you that I, I, I've tried on my own power and might to do this and failed. I have tried with rationality. I've tried sometimes with force. And I've tried sometimes with love and inspiration. And still, it, I just mess it up. I need you. I need your grace, your forgiveness. Your, your encouragement and faith. Lord, give me faith that you can move the mountains, that you are working even when we don't see it. Lord, help me to see exactly where you have placed me and the purpose that you have given me in my life. Help me to walk into that and be sent and to be an ambassador for you, to see myself as no better, also a slave, but a slave in chains of the gospel of the Lord and a chain breaker through the kingdom power that you have given me that you have made all things new that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are the Lord Lord I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow I can't even take care of today but I know that today in my house I want to serve the Lord so Lord help me Help me to find exactly how I can proclaim and demonstrate the reign of our God because I know that you reign. You reign in my failures. You reign in my weakness. You reign in my sin. I cannot do anything to hinder your power in me as long as I come and give you room to work. So first and foremost, not by my might, not by my willpower, but by your spirit, I ask you to enter into my life and transform it from the inside out. If there's any work that you still want to do with your Holy Spirit, I ask that you do it now. Deeper and deeper, transform me and make me new so that I can be used to be an ambassador for you. And then, Lord, allow me to know exactly where I can love others and inspire them to have more of you. This world offers nothing compared to your love. And so, Lord, help me in my brokenness. Help me as a hurt person to heal people. Because it is by your love, by your stripes, by you standing in the gap and charging it to you that we are transformed. So I thank you. I thank you that you're not done yet. I believe the best is yet to come. And I ask for you to make us new. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be doing the voting in a little bit, but first we will have some prayer warriors who are going to come up, and they're willing to stand in the gap for you. 
So if you're struggling or you need some inspiration and just to be prayed over to help you stand in the gap for others, this is the greatest part about the kingdom of God, man. We stand in the gap together so we can stand in the gap for others. So come and receive some prayer. And don't walk away if you don't know that you are loved by God and called to service in his kingdom. That you are enough, not only in God's eyes for his kingdom, but also to be used by him to bring others to life. He has given you the tools, and we want to stand with you as we together as a community transform lives to alert everyone in Vero Beach and beyond that our God reigns, not just in heaven, but right now on earth. Thank you for coming. God bless you.